This is Eric Long, yes. our technical services director, slash a bunch of other stuff. So take it away, Eric. Yep. Hey, everybody, how's it going? Y'all may have seen me on YouTube, y'all probably talked to me on the phone, all that good stuff. Uh, today I'm going to do my demonstrations. Uh, the way we're going to do this this afternoon, I'm sure they briefed you at the motel before y'all came over. I will go through my adhesion tests, uh, go over microfibers, do my Terminator demo. From there, Stephen Forte will give an overview of the spray rig. Uh, after which, once we complete down here, we're going to all go upstairs. When we go upstairs, we're going to all mitigate here to this side of the building. The roof hatch is going to be up in the stairwell there. Uh, from there, we're going to demonstrate the 522 application, address a couple of details. We're going to move over to about the middle of the roof where we have a spreader set up, where Stephen will give another presentation in regards to the spreaders. Uh, we're using a 14 inch today, so if you guys want to pull it, use any of the equipment that's upstairs, by all means. Uh, we went small, so if we have a lot of participants, everybody can have a turn dragging the spreader with them. Uh, after we're done with that section, then we're going to do the silicone section, which is back back towards the roof hatch. There's a small section of the building. Once we're done with the silicone section, on this back side here, there's a small building. Uh, so if you want to walk to the edge there and look down, they address the building where it looks like a big sample. Uh, you'll get an overhead view of all the scenes and details treated in a 520 section finished with silicone. So uh, now that that's out of the way, I'm going to go ahead and start my demonstration. Uh, even though enjoying this warm right now, because when we go upstairs, it's going to be 16 mile per hour wind. It's not so bad. My ears are warming up now. All right. So the first thing I'm going to go over is adhesion test and also how to go about using the wet mill gauge because they kind of go hand in hand. Uh, anytime you go to install a coating system on a roof or you're looking to install a coating system onto a roof, we do suggest adhesion test if it's a uh, unknown substrate, unknown coating, uh, or relatively new substrate. And you just want to verify that a coating is going to adhere to that roof. Uh, then an adhesion test is definitely preferred. Or if the roof is white and it's been coated and you're not 100% sure if it's a silicone or an acrylic, uh, you can definitely figure that out with an adhesion test. If at any time you need to do an adhesion test and you need the materials to do it, give us a call. We'll send you one of these packages. I'll buy that behind me and all around. Uh, and within this package, you're gonna receive a quart sample. Just let us know what products you need uh, and the products that you typically want to use is your base product that you're looking to install the system or a primer. Uh, in some cases, like up here on this roof, they have a raw roof uh, where they installed the urethane system, but they had brand new substrate over there. So we did the adhesion test with urethane, silicone, and primer. And the reason we did the silicone is because it was going up a parapet. If they stopped short with the urethane, they can just address the top coat of the parapets. Um, and it turned out that the silicone stuck extremely well, way better than the uh, urethane did to the Varol section, that brand new section. Uh, the urethane on the old Varol adhered like no other, so they were able to install the system as normal, except for that one little section of wall back over there. Uh, so that's one of the importance of doing adhesion tests. You can figure things out. We also did a primer, so if both the solvent-based materials went south, then we had a water-based rust primer that, that red oxide just seems to adhere to everything. Uh, 520 adheres to it, so if we had adhesion with the 912, then we could prime it and then go with 520. If nothing adhered, worst case scenario, they were looking to heat it up with a torch, remove the aluminum cladding, go straight to the mod bit, and then install as normal. Uh, but that's one of the reasons why you'd want to do an adhesion test, is to figure out a good approach to how you're going to install a job. Um, within this package, you're going to get the quart sample, a small little packet, which is going to contain the instructions on how to do an adhesion test. So if you have a new guy that hasn't done it, or you have somebody that's not quite familiar on how to go about it, it's step-by-step -step instructions that they can use. I, honestly, this stuff's really simple on how to do it. Uh, you're putting coating down on a substrate, 
you clean it, put it down, embed your fabric. Uh, we do include three strips of fabric in with this test, so you can do tests at three different locations. Uh, the primary reason why you'd want to do it in three different locations, maybe you have an area where it looks like they did repair, new substrate, you want to verify that it sticks there. Uh, another section of the roof looks suspicious, you want to check there, or maybe there's a coating on the roof that you also want to check. Another reason why we do three strips is for timing, uh, because a coating, when you go to apply it on the surface, even though we know it adheres, it may not adhere within 24 hours. Uh, it may not adhere after a week. In fact, after the first week of letting that silicone sit on the bra up there, it was peeling off. Uh, peeling off like rubber. I was like, man, we're not getting any adhesion. Came back up here the second week, it, it was glued. Uh, I mean, just pulling on the fabric was ripping off the aluminum. Uh, so timing is a factor because if it doesn't stick the first time, you want to make sure you have the ability to come back a week later without having to do another adhesion test and losing that week that you had already went through. So you're going to, the only thing we don't include is can opener. So if you have a screwdriver or something like that in your truck or a can opener or a key ring or something like that, uh, just open up the can. Typically, I, I would suggest just shaking it first. I didn't shake it, so I gotta stir it. Uh, because you wanna make sure your coating is well mixed. I'm gonna demonstrate on a piece of uh, single ply, but when you go to apply your coating, of course you wipe it off first. Take your coating, we're using two inch fabric, so I'm gonna to look to do like a four inch patch on there. Uh, doesn't have to be super thick. In fact, we really recommend it to be about 24 to 30 mils wet mills. And that's why we include the wet mill gauge. And plus it's not, a bad, not bad to have a lot of these on hand as well. Uh, if you've never used a wet mill gauge before, the numbers on the side represent the mills. Uh, along the bottom here, we're going from 14 up to 30. Flip it over, now you're going from 35 mils up to 80 mils, and the ones on the side are incremental mils, one through 10. Uh, you'll rarely use one through 10. You might use eight if you're doing a half gallon per square. Uh, but when you go to use these, you're gonna just let the wet mill gauge go into the coating, and you're gonna pull it out. If the lighting is correct, you'll be able to see an indention in the coating where your last tooth stuck. Uh, if the lighting isn't really that good, you can use a rag, uh, but ultimately you're just going to push it against something until you get a reading. Uh, right here, I'm even below 14 mils. I went a little too light with it. Uh, no biggie. I'm going to go ahead and embed my fabric into it, and I'll just make up that extra coating with my second pass to embed this fabric. Uh, just like when you do three coursing, you want to make sure you don't have any wrinkles fish mouths or anything like that in your fabric because you want to make sure you have good contact from surface coating and fabric. Now that I know I have a lot of coating built up, uh, I'm going to check my mills. This time it worked. I'm way over 30. Uh, but you just want to place it down on something with contrasting color to see where the last tooth is where it touched. Another thing to remember is when you're on a roof, you're going to have this tail. What I would recommend is find something that's on the roof, maybe an old screw around an AC unit, maybe a rock or something like that, just to hold down the fabric. Uh, because it's always windy on a roof, last thing you want is your fabric to blow right back into your coating and leave you with nothing to grab when you come back to do your actual pull test. I did have one contractor that suggested what he does is he loops it back into the coating to give him a loop to latch onto when he comes back to give him his pull. That's how you perform the adhesion test. Uh, if any of you guys have any questions at any time, please feel free to ask. So we'll say two weeks passed. We're coming back and doing the actual pull test. When you come back to do your pull test, 
we recommend having just a basic fish scale with you because you're going to look for one or two things when you go to do your pull test and that's either you pull it and you know right off the bat you've got great adhesion you're yanking your fabric coating splitting you're using a lot of force or your fabric just rips uh, and the coating still remains you don't need a fish scale for that but if you start pulling on your coating and you're getting some resistance but it's coming up clean from the substrate then you need to check the poundage or the resistance that you're getting from that fabric and on two inch fabric we're looking for four pounds of resistance uh, if you use four inch fabric you're going to look for eight pounds of resistance uh, two pounds for every inch of fabric so i got my fish scale on i i'm going to go to do basically my first test i'm just going to grab the fabric and i'm going to start pulling now on this test it's starting to, it's coming clean i i'm really not getting much much resistance on it uh, but I am getting some. In an instance to where there is absolutely zero adhesion, say you put acrylic over silicone and you're doing an adhesion test that way, when you go pull the fabric, it, it just comes right off. Uh, there's no resistance. In fact, you'll pull up the whole patch. It'll just curl up. But because I have a little bit of resistance, I'm gonna attach my fish scale. I'm gonna pull it back over itself and I'm only getting roughly about two pounds of resistance uh, pulling on the fabric. So this test right here would be a fail or if I was pulling on it and it was look, starting to turn blotchy where I got little instances where the coating was starting to adhere, that's an instance of a timing. It's starting to adhere. I would give it a little bit more time before you just roll it out completely uh, because another week later it may be fully adhered throughout the entire fabric. So waiting another week, come back and do this test. I start pulling on it. I'm getting clear resistance. I mean, no fish scale needed. It's ripping the coating and the coating staying stuck to the substrate. That is great adhesion right there. That is actually what you're looking for uh, when you apply a coating. Uh, if you start getting to the point where you're questioning I'm at 3.8 pounds or I'm right at 4 pounds of resistance and it's coming up clean, it, it ain't going to go anywhere, uh, but it's kind of an iffy situation in that case. If something goes up there, slits the coating, water is able to intrude somehow, uh, I wouldn't have as much faith as I would with this that if a slit happened, water couldn't travel through, but in an instance like this, it just seems too easy for that water to eventually start working itself under the coating. What do you do different to make one better than the other? <laughs> the magic. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, what we did in this situation, because in our warehouse we work with new EPDM to make our samples, uh, it took us a couple of years of R&D. I, I used to soak it in xylene to try to chemically age it to get our coatings to stick. Uh, but we had a sales rep join us a year ago and he had a great idea to take a belt sander to it. Um, and from then on, that's how we make our samples uh, and that's how we're able to do this adhesion test. Uh, this is 520 of a brand new EVDM. Uh, so if any of you guys are ever installing brand new EVDM, here's your test results on what 520 will do on that. Now, if you have a guy in your crew that you don't like and you kind of want him to quit, you can give him a little belt sander. If you know you got five squares of repair that needs to be done, and three days of time that you can afford to let them up there and just grind away, oh, you'll get great adhesion. But we all know that's not feasible. So. <laughs> um, that's pretty much it for the adhesion test portion and wet mill gauges. Uh, with the wet mill gauge, it's great to use on flat roofs. Because on a flat roof, you want to make sure your application is correct uh, as you put it down. Because the only way you're going to be able to check your job when you're done is to co cut little samples in it, use a comparator to check your DFTs. Now, when you do a metal roof, this next device is one of those magnetic mill gauges. Uh, this is one of the fancy ones that you get an app on your phone. It connects Bluetooth. It will save each reading that you do. You can compile batch batch reports 
Um, it kind of comes in handy because I can work with my phone, take pictures, and get readings uh, all at the same time. But they do make these in many different forms. Uh, they have the old school mechanical ones where it's the magnetic and you have to turn it until it clicks. Uh, or they make even cheaper ones of these that are pretty cut and dry. You just put it down, you get your reading, and you can move on. Uh, this one's pretty pricey. It's about fifteen hundred, two grand. Uh, but the little cheaper ones, you can get them for a hundred bucks, two hundred bucks. Uh, but if you do go cheap and you're looking at these, just make sure that it is able to read the DFTs that you're installing. Uh, this one actually goes up to about 180 DFTs. I saw a cheap one for a hundred bucks. Scott sent me an email and said, hey, check this out. It had a max reading of 60 DFTs, which is fine for your base and top coats. Uh, but if you're wanting to check any detail work or anything like that where the requirement is 60 DFT, you're going to be right on the edge there. Uh, and after you put your base and top coat on, uh, you're outside the realm. But this thing's pretty nifty. If you've never used one of these, it's real easy. Once your job's installed, uh, I, I use this on occasion to do little QC work on my little samples back there that Nick makes. Uh, we were joking earlier that this sample fails. We're only at 18 DFT uh, for a metal seal sample. Uh, that's, a, that's a fail. <laughs> uh, but it gives you the ability real quick to kind of double check your system, especially if you're getting a system warranty or something like that. You know Rick's going to come out and inspect your job. Um, it's good to kind of do a test run before he comes out. So if you are short, you already know what to expect when he gets out there. Um, so these are kind of handy to have. The next thing I'm going to go over are microfibers. Uh, this is our thickening agent for all of our spray gray coatings, uh, 211, Butyl, 520, 410, 412. Uh, it's basically a polystyrene fluffy powder. If it's a real windy day like it is upstairs, I wouldn't recommend opening this on a roof. Uh, I'm sure you guys all seen Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas where he opens up his little vial of coke and it all blows away and he goes, oh my God, look at what God did. Uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't want that to happen with us either on the roof. Uh, you also don't want to... Talk about that again, Eric. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> hey, I got good results about my third fast. I did it as a joke. All right. Fast on the road, I normally have this stuff in a baggie. It's easier to transport. Luckily, we haven't gotten pulled over yet because... <laughs> Something tells me that's not going to go very well. Uh, but with this product, in this case, uh, I'm going to mix it with some 520. When you use this product, we recommend starting with like a 25% ratio. Uh, basically, if you're going to thicken up one gallon, you'll just use a quart of this. It comes in five gallon pails. But that's just a starting point. And it's real handy to have just on hand because it's say you're installing a Uracil system, a Metagard system, a 10 year, I don't think it'll work too well with a 12 year unless you have some 520 around. But if you're doing the standard Metagard system and you have 211 on hand, or if you're doing the Uracil and you have 420, uh, 520 on hand and you run out of your mastic while you're on the job, uh, you can have some of this on hand and use a little bit of your base coat to make up that difference in mastics. Uh, so that way you don't have to call in the Sam, <clears throat> place your order, wait a day, become at mercy of the freight gods. Maybe it'll be there the next day, maybe it won't. Uh, so it's a good way to basically continue your job without too many snags. Uh, we also had an instance where I had some of this in the back and the contractor ran out of stuff and he asked if we could overnight 522. No, we can't. Uh, if I have any of this in the warehouse and you run into that pickle right there, uh, this stuff I can't, can be overnighted. Uh, but that isn't a normal thing. That's for emergency purposes because that's my secret stash in the back of the warehouse. Uh, but when you go to mix this, you're going to use the standard mixing drill. And as you can see, I added too much right offhand. Uh, and it thickened it already to the point where 
is not even a coating anymore. But you can mix until your desired thickness is achieved uh, with this. So if you need something really thick that you're putting on a vertical situation, say a parapet, a vent, a wall, or something like that, you need absolute zero sag. Uh, you can use this to thicken it up to that point. Sometimes 522 isn't thick enough. It, it'll sag and run on you as well. Uh, you can mix it in with that as well, but 520 is a little bit easier to mix than the 522. So I would definitely recommend using 520. Uh, but that's pretty much how the microfibers work. Uh, if you're using it in a solvent-based material, it does start the cure process. So this isn't something that you can blend up in the warehouse at 8 o'clock in the morning and go do a repair at 5 o'clock at night. Uh, you'll probably open up your container to a brick, and that ain't going to do you any good. Uh, so try to save the mixing as much as possible on the site or if you're literally at the shop and you're going straight to that job site uh, and it's relatively close and you can go ahead and blend it and have it ready to go. Any questions on the microfibers? All right, moving on. So next thing I'm going to do is my Terminator demo. Uh, Terminator is a relatively new product in our lineup. It is designed to really be a repair product because it is able to be applied underwater or to wet surfaces. So in the event there's a rainstorm going on, you're in Florida, it's always raining, um, and you need to go up and do a repair or the surface is just wet, <clears throat> You can use the Terminator. The Terminator is basically a siliconized urethane. Thank you. That adheres to basically all the known substrates that we tested it on. Uh, the most common ones, your metal, galvanized, <clears throat> mod bits, single plies, EPDMs, spray foams. Uh, and it also sticks to coatings and our coatings adhere to it as well. It sticks to acrylics, urethanes, butyls, silicones, and that's one of the biggest things about this is it sticks to silicone. Uh, and all these products will stick to it as well. So that's one of the things that, you know, if you're on a roof and you have a small little patch of silicone on there and you're installing the Ur Uracil system, if you don't want to just sit there and duck and dodge around these little silicone pa patches, you could go over the silicone patches with a little bit of Terminator and then just install as normal with your urethane. Uh, that's one application for this, but most of the time, this is just used mainly for repairs. But I'm gonna demonstrate on a piece of mod bit here underwater. Water's a little cold. Should have heated this up before. But uh, basically, if you get a repair and you identify where the leak is coming from, you can use a caulk gun uh, because it comes in 10 ounce tubes, 20 ounce tubes, or two gallon pails. If you're using pails, it works just as well. You can use a trawl. In fact, I'm going to use a uh, stick here to spread it out once I get it down. But if it's a small little area, you're just going to apply your product and work it outwards. Say so if it's a bullet hole that went through, you probably want to go out about three inches. You want to make sure that uh, you get it spread out enough to where water isn't going to continue to go underneath the coating. <clears throat> And you want to make sure that your surface is clean. If your surface isn't clean, say you are working in a ponded area, uh, unfortunately, it probably won't get adhesion that first go around if it's not clean because you're only going to adhere to the algae and the dirt and the soot that builds up in those areas. Uh, the good news is, though, if it doesn't stick, I had a contractor call me. He did a repair. He said stuff didn't stick the first go around. I reapplied it, and it stuck like no other. So. The first pass could be a good cleaning agent, but it's an expensive cleaner if that's the case. Um, but to mix it out, I mean, it's it's mastic grade, so it is somewhat thick. Uh, keep in mind, I had a little bit of urethane on this popsicle stick before I stuck it in this water. Uh, but typically in water, you won't get no rainbow effect. It doesn't come up to the surface. Uh, and basically it just adheres right on the spot. Uh, water does start the cure process, but it doesn't cure immediately. Uh, something at this application rate does take about 24 hours before it's completely cured. It is dry to the touch in about three hours, depending on how thick you put it on. Uh, this one has been sitting underwater. Uh, 
Ironically, it's not a little slimy. Sometimes it feels a little slimy after sitting in the water. But it, on granulated mod bed, I mean, I know you are probably like he's cheating. Everything sticks to this stuff. But uh, it's, it's on there. I mean, it's not even ripping up the granules. So, but that's the Terminator. Uh, what I demoed was the 622. It's the thinner of the products. 624 is the thickest of the products. The 624 is mainly designed for vertical applications and stuff like that as well. Uh, but other than that, you guys have any questions? Well, that concludes phase one of my demos. And you'll hear me again upstairs. So I'm going to go ahead and pass this over to Stephen Forte. Uh, and he will go over the spray rig. thick 
thicker acrylics for you know roof coatings. So certain things like that, you want to make sure it's unobstructed. If you start getting you know sputtering and it starts clogging your tip a lot, we've had that happen. You get batches where you just have some gunk in it, right? Um, what we've had to do, you know, if we're not pumping it out of the drum and we're doing a direct immersion kit, we're actually putting it in a hopper, which typically will come off the bottom and it'll be a big 12 gallon hopper and you're pouring five gallon buckets in. When you're doing it like that, that's probably the best way to spray it because it's gravity fed. The pump on the upstroke isn't having to pull as hard. It's literally just, it's right in there and goes right back out. So you have very limited cavitation, which prolongs your packings, allows you to have a longevity in your system. But, um, you know, with that being said, those guys, with what they were doing, it, it, it made sense for what they were doing with having to take this out and, and all that. So, um, I lost my train of thought there. <laughs> and it turned out to be the piston was bad. Was it, was it the, the, piston the piston was bad? Was bad. Oh, okay. Was it the packings or the piston? The packings. The packings, the packings on the yeah. piston? Okay. Yeah, and that, and that will do it. Um, and and that will happen with cavitation. You'll, you can tell, guys, if you're, if you're sitting there watching this thing go and it'll, it upstrokes and it clicks and downstrokes, if you see that thing skip and then catch back at the last part of the stroke, you're cavitating. And that continues for any length of time, you're going to burn up those packings. The packings, as you, there's three types of packings. There's tough, then there's X tough, and then there's XX tough, right? The first set is literally these plastic rings with a leather ring and a plastic ring and a leather ring all smushed together, right? And so you've got, for instance, on this one, you got this sleeve, right? And there's two sets of packings. There's a packing that is right here on this throat. And so that, pit, that keeps the product from spitting out of here. And then on the piston, there's a hole through that piston and then there's holes in the side. So it literally pushes through the center of the piston and out the sides. And then there's that set of packing that's on it. If I, we had it taken apart, we could show you. Um, but literally you have two of those sets of packings that create, so you have the ability to push the product on the upstroke and the downstroke. If those packings go out, if you're new to this, like I was years and years ago, you're like, okay, I don't, they're like, don't touch your product. Don't, don't mess with the system, right? And you're like freaking out. You're in the middle of a job. You know, all of a sudden your throat packings just blew and you got stuff just coming out of your throat packings. It's done. You know, and unless you have a trailer that's set up like I ended up doing, I got a 16 foot trailer with a table, a vise, a parts washer and all this stuff, then, you know, you're gonna end up taking this thing down, trying to hose it out, clean it out best you can, and take it to like a Sherwin Williams commercial store and hope that they can get to you in a fair amount of time. And then you either gotta go find somebody that's got one or rent one, right? So you gotta be careful. I recommend going, I'm telling you, I've learned the hard way of going through this and doing that exactly what I just said. And pushing silicone, by the way, in the middle of a silicone project out of town, and that happened on 933. I can't tell you how many times I've had to replace packings on a 933. Guys, but it is, it done so much I can do it with my eyes closed, okay? I won't go through and talk later about my horror stories with the 933, and because I was one of the guinea pigs, I got it when it first came out. We ended up replacing the lower with a high flow lower instead of this filter housing lower, and it completely eliminated this and it literally pulled it in and pushed it out. I didn't even have a bleeder valve. So when you got something stuck and you had 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 pounds of pressure on the line, you had no way to release it other than going, they told me on the phone, they go, well, just take a, a rag and put it around this uh, your outhousing here. Just turn it slowly with the pressure off. And I'm like, really? It's got 5,000 pounds of pressure off. But okay, and it worked, but uh, nobody got hurt. But, you know, they now have a bleeder valve on the new high slope. So they listened to me at least to get that put in. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, one of the things that we, we started doing, and a lot of guys asked me, well, you know, what are some of the things that you can do to speed up your process on, you know, spraying, right? Different things. One of the things we talked about yesterday with a couple guys was, you know, when you're doing a metal roof, you know, you, you're doing your vertical seams, your horizontal seams, your screws, for instance, on an R fan, probably one of the more, you know, labor intensive systems to do. What we're doing is we're getting, instead of, sorry guys, we're getting our, we're getting 220 drums instead of buckets, right? We're still getting, we get 220 drums still, right? Yeah. So we, you can get it in buckets and hopper fill it if you're doing it with a hopper. If you're gonna if you're gonna pull it 
220 is a thicker product, it's going to put a little more pressure on your pump. I would recommend getting yourself a hopper. And have a, if you're going to have a guy handling your, your system anyways, why not just get the hopper and pour buckets? It's a little more expensive, obviously, because you got buckets. It's an extra bucket gallon, I think. But it's easier to maintain, easier to move. A 55 gallon drum, even with dollies, are just tough to move. If you're not on a concrete surface, I've been at jobs where we've been in the middle of grass or gravel. Try to put one of those on a dolly, 550, 600 pounds, and try to move that by yourself, or even with a second person. It's just not that easy. So I've always been an advocate of doing buckets, even though it's a tad more expensive. It's just easier, right? 220 is the brush grade acrylic, okay? And that's what we use on the Medigar system for doing seams, doing fasteners, and doing, doing minor details. You can get 222 and 224, which is flashing grade and caulking grade, which get even thicker for you know other applications. So, and what we'll do is we'll take all that, we'll end up taking off the tip, and literally we'll put our longer wand on it, and we'll have our set, just like we're spraying, I got a guy holding my hose, I got another guy with a stick with a three inch chip brush tape to it, and I'm literally running down that seam on the vertical, just keeping the, the tip right against it, extruding essentially at a lower rate, I turn it down a little, and I'm pushing it out and the guy comes right behind it with that little chip brush and pushes it down. Before we got smart and did that, we were doing butyl tape, two, three inch butyl tape. And it was still less expensive and faster on the labor than going up there and pulling it out and doing it with a chip brush on a vertical seam. There's a lot of them. Horizontal seams the same way. All the screws, we're just putting a dollop of daisy on it type thing and the guys can come back and just brush it in. So that's one of the ways that you can extremely speed up your labor on that detail work, which takes so much of our time. That's probably the most labor intensive outside of pressure washing, you know, when you're doing these types of roofs, prepping. So um, with this with this system, I mean, I can go through a lot of the different nuances of how to use it and operate it. Um, you know, this is the this is how you turn it on, you turn off the hydraulics to spray, this is your pressure sense. Um, we have a we install a, a pressure gauge right here so you know where your pressure's at. Um, you know, this particular one on the 833s, you, you know, just like, you know, using a paint spray, you push down the prime on your prime, you pull back up. The 933 is a tad different, but not entirely different to where it's out of the question. They got a Honda motor on them, they run great. You know, you have your little safety thing here where you're using, you know, for grounding, put a rod in the ground, screwdriver, hook it up to it just to make sure you don't get any spark. Typically with acrylics, that's not an issue, but if you're using a solvent-based system, whether you're using the 410 or you're using urethane, which I don't think you'd ever want to spray urethane. That's, I mean, that, that's a sticky product and hard to clean. Anything solvent-based, you definitely want to make sure you're grounded, obviously, because God forbid something happens. You just, look, anomalies happen, right? And if hard luck, it's going to happen to one of us. Um, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen to me. So, um, what am I missing? What am I missing? I feel like I'm missing something. Anything, any questions right off the bat? Spray tips. Spray tips, thank you. All right, so you've got your different spray tips. When you're using a 933, the, the, the PSI rating is about 4,000. So you're not, you're not really, you're not gonna really see really high PSIs. You can use a rack tip that is rated for that, which I think are the orange tips, if I'm not mistaken. Somebody tell me differently, because I don't typically use them. Not the nine, the 833s. Yeah, 833s, your PSI can drop about 4,000 roughly. So you're using the basic rack tip. It's almost like the ones you see in a paint, regular paint spray to the degree. The 933s though, if you're rated for the 7250 with that particular lower that's uh, the, it's got the smaller housing, it's not a high flow. The minute you go to the high flow, which is what they're actually putting on most of these for roofers now, because when you call them, they're gonna ask you all these questions. What are you using it for? What are you spraying? They're gonna try to customize it to what you're doing. And typically now they're gonna put that high flow lower on here that we talked about, which you go down from a 7250 PSI down to about 5,500 to 6,000, depending on what you're spraying. Um, and so the, the whole point, you know, even back in the day, years ago, when I was spraying a different product um, with high solid silicone, their whole point was we got to atomize the product at the tip, right? You want to get a good fan, you want to get good coverage, and that way you're not all over the place with your mill fan. In my opinion, as long as I'm getting a good fan and I'm not getting what we call fingers, where it looks like it's squirting out all weird and all that from different pressures or whatever, I, I, I don't need 7,000 pounds of pressure, especially when you open that thing up, it's, and it calms back down. 7,000 is a lot of pressure, guys. 
4,000 is a lot of pressure, but it's a little more manageable. But you know, you can spray high solid silicone, and I've done it and had incredible build fitness across the board on metal and flat roofs at five to 6,000 PSI, okay? You don't have to have 7,000 in my opinion, okay? If you're getting a good fan and you're doing your quality checks and you're getting your build thicknesses and you're consistent, you got a good quality check going, in my opinion, don't, don't overwhelm the pump because let's be honest, five versus 7,000 is gonna be harder on the pump. Let's be honest, it's gonna wear your packings out quicker and that kind of thing. So it, it's gonna be a judge of a, a test as you learn about this and, and how you're gonna go through it. Um, I, when it comes to changing packings, and I'll go to that, like I said, on my 933, I'm to the point where I've got packings on standby, I got my trailer there. It's like, when's it gonna happen? You know, because it's gonna happen. And boom, all of a sudden, like, man, I'm getting no pressure, help me out. And the radio went down to me. And I'm the one handling the pump because I don't trust nobody to touch my pump. And I'll have another laborer with me helping me move stuff. And I'm sitting here doing it, calling them back, getting back and forth. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, we gotta break it down. Out, and then we'll break it down. It literally takes me two seconds to just boom, 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 because I've got the stuff, I know what I'm doing. And um, and then, oh, packings are bad on the piston. We'll put it in the vise, because you gotta put it in the vise, break it loose, put some new packings on, in 30 minutes I'm back up and running. But I've done it enough to do it. I had a guy that came down from Atlanta, um, Christian. He actually was pumping some silicone, called me up, he's like, hey, I got, I got an issue. What, I, think my, I think my pump's down. What am I gonna do? Can, you, can I borrow your pump? And I'm like, you got packings? He's like, I got packings. It's a 933. So I just hauled my trailer, I think it was up to Birmingham or something or whatever it was. And took my trailer, hooked everything up, took care of him, replaced his packings, he was back up there now by the time I got there. So if you're close to Montgomery and I'm in town, I'll come bring my trailer and I'll help you out. <laughs> but, uh, or if you need to, you can call me, you'll get my information, I'll tell you what you need to do. If you happen to have that, like there was a particular time where five sets of packings on an 1100 square job went out. Five sets of packings on a 933. I'll, I'll tell you later what happened with that. There was an issue. We figured out what it was, even though I went on tech support for 17 hours, it seemed like, um, trying to figure out what the problem was. But they, they luckily had a shop with device and everything, so we were able to get it all taken care of. But I've seen guys that do some of my other work with the 833. This is why I love the 833. In my opinion, it's probably one of their best built products. And so what they're able to, these guys will literally pump thousands and thousands of gallons through. And they'll just literally, at the end of the job, they just lock everything up, wrap it all up. I mean, stuff's dripping out of it still, out of the, the primer hose. They'll just pull it into the trailer, lock it up and roll. Next week, pull it out, put everything in together, fire it up, keep going. It's amazing. Matt is one of those ones. It's, it's just mind-blowing that he can have that kind of luck where you can just wrap up the acrylic deal, put it in his trailer, a week later pull it out and he's able to spray. I would, my crap would have all gummed up, it would have been a nightmare. But, and he's pumped, and he'll go for two years before he has to replace a packing in the 833s. If you use it, you know what you're doing, you use it the right way, even though he abuses his stuff too, it's resilient, the 833. So, to my point about what to spray, what not to spray, don't spray urethane if you can help it, right? You know, it's a tough thing to spray. Silicones, if you're gonna spray a silicone, I recommend spraying the 410. If you're gonna spray the 412, you better have a 933, and you better have three quarter hose starting out, and you better taper yourself down, and you better make sure you have somebody that knows what's going on, because you're gonna tear up your pump. I don't care even though the 933s are a great system, the X70s with the hydraulic, the air driven are still good too. The lower that they're now replacing those with came off the X7, by the way. So, um, I do not recommend putting silicone on a roof. I know there's Metasil product, and there's, there's applications where that's necessary, but unless it's spec or it's something that you just have to do for some reason because maybe it's a plant and they have animal fats or it's a restaurant or something along those lines, silicone on metal is probably a last resort. It's expensive, and if it's nothing along those lines with restaurant, animal fat factory, or some other real weird spec by whatever, don't do it. Push acrylic, spray acrylic, it's easier, it's cheaper. Water-based, so you can, you know, obviously take care of that and get it cleaned out. When you're cleaning, uh, I actually was able to hook up, like when you have your long hoses, right? I'll, I'll, I'll put in some water and I'll pump out all that stuff that's in the lines until it's starting to come out like milk, right, real thin. 
Then I went to Home Depot and I got one of those little connectors. This is threaded on one side and it's a hose thing on the other to go onto a hose. And I hook it up to a hose, screw it on, and then just let that clean my line out. That way I'm not suspended because this will take you forever to clean out your pump, your hoses, right? I can hook it up to a water line and just flush it out that way. Because if not, you're gonna spend 30 minutes trying to get to the point where it's coming out even halfway clear out of your hose. If you do it that way, 10, 15 minutes, that's running while you're doing your pump and you're pumping it out right here, making sure it's nice and flush. If you're using leather packings at the very least, at the very end of the day, if you're the type of person like me, at the end of the job, you're cleaning your stuff out, you're really maintaining it, run some mineral spirits through it to make sure that that preserves the leather packings and it also keeps everything nice and well lubed in there. Even if you're using the X-Tough packings, because when you go to that next step with those higher pressures, the leather packings aren't there anymore. It's all literally blue, black, blue, black, these Teflon rings pressed together, and that's your packing. That's what creates your seal. Or and those things spray or spread like we need to do. Which we're about to do. But when you're doing, and you can, we talk about when we get up there, the, the profile spreaders. You can spread with a profile spreader over a metal roof. But in my opinion, it's a very absolute last resort unless you're like you're on a a government project like we were one time with Apache helicopters, like you are not spraying around these things, you know, or if you're around a car dealership and you're just like, I don't want to risk getting these Mercedes Stand all covered. When you get up there, but, okay. Yeah, all those ones. Awesome, that sounds good. <laughs> um, so, I think I've pretty much covered all that. Is there anything else I'm missing, guys? How often do you change your tips? Do you have any trouble with plug tips and do you use self-cleaning tips if, if you do? Well, um, when it comes to tips, and one thing I did miss, on the high pressure, you're gonna use the high pressure tips, they're gray, they're expensive. Um, I'm still using a whole box of tips that I got when I went off on Graco when the last time my things blew up, and they just sent me like a couple thousand dollars worth of uh, tips. So if your thing blows up, just call up warranty services and cuss them out. They might be able, they might send you a bunch of tips and guards and you'll be able to use those for a while because they're expensive. Um, but you have to flip the tip around to spray it out. When you get clogged up, you turn the tip around and it sprays it in what's called discharging. Yeah, it's a good word. And, um, and it, it gets rid of that, you turn it back around, you're good to go. There's no self-cleaning tips that I'm aware of, unless there is, I'm, I'm, I'm unaware of them, but um, the tips, you go through tips, it just depends. I can use a tip on a one tip on a whole job and there's sometimes where I'm blowing through tips for some reason, it just depends. Yeah. Silicones are gonna be harder on it and then acrylics are not gonna be so hard. Obviously, I'm running out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else have any other questions before we get up on the roof? Obviously, don't ask them, because. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Stephen.